I walk into the hallways at Google, I'm speaking to the black service workers. I'm speaking to the black janitors. I'm speaking mm-hmm. to the black cooks and chefs. And I'm like, hey, what's up? How's your day going? Like, mm-hmm. I make sure that black people in corporate spaces feel visible because I know mm-hmm. what it's like to walk into an office and feel like, you know, I don't belong or I don't matter. Welcome to Show Your Receipts, where we believe if you can see it, you can be it. Receipts are evidence or proof that something has occurred. Our guests are evidence that Black excellence is alive and well. They will be sharing their receipts on how they've been able to accomplish so much in their life. I'm your host, Tony Jackson. Let's get started. Welcome to Show Your Receipts where we believe if you can see it, you can be it. I am super excited to introduce and have a conversation with my guest today. Her name is Cheyenne Baggett. I'll read a short bio of Cheyenne. It's truly amazing. Cheyenne is a native of the vibrant west side of Chicago. She embodies the, which embodies the resilience and determination ingrained in her upbringing. Raised by a single mother alongside four brothers, Cheyenne's journey is a testament to her unwavering spirit and commitment to excellence. A standout athlete from early years, Cheyenne excelled at Whitney Whitney M. Young High School uh, in Chicago, representing her community as a USA track and field junior Olympian. Her athletic prowess paved the way for a scholarship um, at DePaul University, where she not not only shattered, I'm going to emphasize that word again, shattered. (laughs) On a broken leg, by the way. On a broken leg, shattered school (laughs) records but also found a lifelong sisterhood as a distinguished member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Lambda Chapter Incorporated. You're supposed to be incorporating that. <laughs> you know, that's my Fuel- Yes, fueling her passion for service and leadership, Cheyenne emerged as a driving force within her sorority, serving as marketing director and leading her chapter to earn the coveted title of Chapter of the Year. Grounded in principles of scholarship, sisterhood and service Cheyenne's dedication to community uplift that has been a guiding force throughout her life beyond track in the classroom Cheyenne has emerged steadfast in her commitment to affecting positive change from early days volunteering in her neighborhood to her current endeavors she is deeply invested in empowering marginalized communities uh, particularly focusing on economic mobility for black individuals including those formerly incarcerated Professionally, Cheyenne's journey has been marked by versatility and impact. With a portfolio boasting renowned brands like Fisher-Price, Gatorade, McDonald's, Intel, and SC Johnson, she has consistently demonstrated her strategic acumen and innovative approach. Currently serving as a global strategy account manager at Google, Cheyenne leverages her expertise to empower clients in navigating the digital landscape, driving product adoption, and maximizing online marketing goals, particularly through AI, YouTube, and performance products. Committed to driving change beyond the boardroom, Cheyenne leads her expertise to various boards and initiatives. From her involvement with the Chicago Advertising Federation, young professionals to her av- to her advocacy as a ambassador for Reskill Americans. She champions diversity, equity, inclusion in both corporate and community spheres. As as she continues to break barriers and uplift others, Cheyenne Baggett stands as a beacon of inspiration, embodying the power of perseverance, service, and purpose-driven leadership. And we have her here today. Welcome, Cheyenne. Thank you so much, Tony. I'm I'm honored to be here. I want to give you your flowers for even just like creating a platform for to spread and promote visibility with black young professionals. So definitely kudos to you. It is very important. Like you said, if you can see it, you can achieve it. And I think right now more than ever, like we need all the encouragement that we can get from our peers. So thank you so much for even creating, show your receipts. Absolutely. You know? I, I, I appreciate that. Cheyenne, your story is very impactful. And one of the key reasons why I want the interview is because Listening to what you've accomplished, where you've come from, I really do believe that by us getting this information out, it's going to definitely inspire some young boy or some young girl somewhere who's watching this. So let's dive right into it. So we know that you work at Google. Google is a very uh, famous company, arguably the most 
one of the most famous companies in the world. People yeah. know, everyone knows Google. Yeah. And let's kind of dig down into what you do specifically. I think people have an idea in general what Google does. But, you know, it's been said that money earned is a reflection of problem solved. Mm. And the current role that you serve at, at Google, what kind of problems are you tasked to solve? Yeah, that's a great question. I think now because there's so many brands, there's so many new competitors coming into the every single space now with any industry, I think customers are facing competition in pricing, but also making sure that they're targeting the right consumer, right? I think right now, people have a lot more decisions to make, you know, when we talk about price points right now with the pandemic and just how the economy is, you know, there's more consumers being a little uh, financially responsible now. So it's like, how can I create value for my customer, target the right customer at the right time with the right product? So I think (laughs) in a nutshell, we're finding that clients are having a hard time targeting the right consumer in a relevant stage in their consumer journey. So while a person is searching for a product, how am I getting my product and messaging to reach them at the right time? Absolutely. Absolutely. And we need to talk because I got some questions on there with our business. (laughs) For sure. You You could coach me up a little bit. Let's dive into a little bit more on, you know, the the marketing side of what you do. You know, it almost feels like in recent years, uh, the concept of working in marketing or being a marketer has become like a superstar industry. It's like, you know, people want to be involved in it. It seems very cool. It's like guys are the ones who are driving traffic and creating campaigns and and actually responsible for driving revenue. Yeah. Uh, Talk to me about what made you decide to go into the field of marketing. Oh, okay. Well, I joke around about it oftentimes because I feel as though it was like the right accident. It was like, Mm. it just happened. I had the intention of going, going into college, being a pre-bio, I mean, yeah, biochemistry major, pre-med major, sorry. It's been so long that I I didn't even know what I was at one point in time. And I really wanted to be a doctor, right? Um, but attending classes and also being an athlete, I I personally found it hard to juggle the rigorous like workload of the like biochem classes and also continue to be a very like elite athlete. And so for me, I had to do some internal, you know, digging and I had to make a decision or am I really passionate about science or did I want to do it because I know it made me money? I think Mm. growing up, you know, being from the West side of Chicago with like a single mom, I, I really wanted to go to college to get a great job so I could take care of myself. And Mm. from my knowledge and watching TV shows, I feel like doctors and lawyers made the most amount of money. They worked the hardest, but they made like a lot of money. And so that was primarily my goal going into college but seeing those test scores, I'm like, okay, do I want to be an average student? I'm not an average person. Mm. Oh, so what's going on here? One of my first black professors at DePaul, you know, he sat me down. He's like, what are you good at and what do you like to do? And my answer was, I don't really know. I just know that I like people. I like talking to people. I like being collaborative. I like to be in a team environment, you know, because my sports background. And he's like, okay, go on DePaul's website and look at the communication courses. Take a communication course next quarter and see if you like it. I did that. I absolutely loved the course. And so I just chose to become a PR marketing major from that one course that I took. And I just did really well at those courses. Like I got like straight A's in in the classes. So I'm like, okay, this is something I'm clearly digesting. I'm understanding and I'm good at. So we're just going to go ahead and get my degree in this. That is an incredible story. And and I'm sure Google, Google is glad that you didn't become a doctor, you know? Hey, yes. Yes. I'm sure they are. (laughs) So, uh, I guess the next question I have is because, you know, when people talk about marketing, 
it it, it seems to be a very general thing. Like, um, you know, uh, is uh, and, and the question I have for you is, what does a typical day as a person working in marketing for Google, what does a typical day look like for you? Yeah, that is a great question. It varies. It, and I'm sure when you talk to marketing people, media people, they'll probably give you the same cliched like response, but it's really true. Like your job as a marketer is to just problem solve, like mm -hmm. nonstop problem solving. The vertical that I actually sit under at Google is our large customer sales vertical. So while I'm in a sales like facing role, I feel though a lot of the times I'm in like a media consultant type of role at Google. So my client will come to me with a problem and like it's my job and my responsibility to help them find a solution using Google products. So oftentimes I think marketing in general is just trying to solve a problem. Like if you can solve a problem with a solution, right? Like you're kind of in the sphere of marketing, if that means. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So let me dig into that a little bit more. So what type of skill sets are required to excel at what you do? Like, do you have to be like a super tech person and be able to code and all this kind of stuff? No. Does it require you to be like this artistic person where you're like, a, you know, a super creative yeah. and had more of like executive type of skills where you're working in teams and managing products? Like, what is the skill set that's required to excel? Yeah. I Okay. Before I was in tech, I thought tech was coding, you know, UX, UI designing, and it is that, but it's so much more than just like limited to those two type of roles. You know, like you, you could be a project manager in tech. I am more in the sales vertical, the media and sales consulting vertical of tech. Like there's the finance part of tech. Like tech, it, tech encompasses every single industry. So I just want to like caveat that for people who didn't know previously what tech really is. Every major businesses, the core is probably going to be some type of tech core. But for as, as far as skills, I think, I think anybody can work in tech. And I think the skills that you're learning or you've already gained in your previous job as an account manager, project manager, finance manager, those like those can all be just like transfer over in and transfer over into a tech space. Mm -hmm. Um, so if you're a strategic thinker, like obviously that's a great skill because you talk about problem solving. If we are in the business to solve the world's biggest problem as a strategic thinker, you are an asset, right? If you're really good at finances and, uh, uh, financial modeling that, that that's a great benefit to have. That could be transferred over to, I don't know, a role in the finance department at a tech company. So I really just think that like whatever skill that you've kind of crafted for yourself, you can just apply that to a tech facing like role. And even if you are a creative person, like when you think about UX, UI design, you're creating what the, the, you're creating what the consumer sees. So it's the techie creative type of role and there's more roles like outside of the ux ui design that can be applied to text our rules team is responsible for like creating spaces like creating like the spaces at google so when you go into like a google office and you're seeing like oh my gosh everything is so like creatively placed our furniture all our walls like all of that has to do with like rules and so, like, they're really tasked with making the Google space, like, creative or other mm. and they feel, like, comfortable and feel like that we're ready to work. So I think, I think there's a lot of skills that can be applied. What I would suggest is finding what skill you, like, you've already started to hone and see what role that you can get, get at Google or in whatever tech company that can be transferred over. That's like my biggest type of advice. Absolutely. Awesome. And so let's touch a little bit on academics. You know, looking at your academic history, I mean, you went to the uh, historic and prestigious Whitney Young Go um, in Chicago, you know, one of the top schools in the city, maybe one of the top schools in the state of Illinois. Um, then you went on to DePaul, another great school. 
been, you know, you, you switched to the communications and PR major and got all A's. And I think you just recently, you're getting the MBA. Is that correct? Yeah, God, you know, God willing, I am. Uh, yes, I recently just applied to business school a month ago. <laughs> Absolutely. That is amazing. I have no doubt that you're going to succeed there. Thank you. Talk to me about the role that education plays to be able to work in the kind of position that you're in. Is this something that um, to be in your position, do you have to be a person who was like top of the class, top, you know, best schools? Is it more of a, a grit type of thing where it's just, you know, you're a hustler, you're a hard worker, mm-hmm. you know, are they, are they looking at, you know, what kind of, you know, did she get all A's? And, you know, I guess what role did your current uh, academic history play and uh, you be, you being able to get yeah. the job that you have and thrive? Yeah, I think what a degree does is give you the opportunity to get your foot in the door. Does it necessarily necessarily guarantee it absolutely not so i think that my degree like afforded me the op- the opportunity to feel empowered to apply for roles because obviously you're taught from a young age to get a good job you got to go to college right so that is kind of why i i i invested a lot into prioritizing college and school 100 percent shout out to my mom my mom is an educator She's a business owner. She owns a daycare, sent a business. So a lot of my, you know, schooling and my passion for learning stems from my mother. I don't believe it. Okay. If you were to have asked me this five years ago, I would have said absolutely everyone needs a degree in order to like work in tech or even have like a really good job. Today, in today's time, I don't think a degree is 100% necessary. There's plenty of people who work at Google who do not have a degree. Mm-hmm. I think going back to some of, going back to your questions about what type of skills, I think then it it really depends on like, well, what skills do you have to offer? So are you a strategic thinker? Like at Google, and I'm pretty sure at most companies hire vets, right? Vets do mm-hmm. not. Have, most vets don't have college degrees. However, they have leadership skills. They right. have, they th- they are able to make decisions very quickly, and oftentimes it they tend to be great great decisions. So I think mm-hmm. in today's world, a degree should be used as a tool mm-hmm. to get to where you want. I think if you don't have a degree, do not feel discouraged. Build a skill set. Yeah. If you don't have a degree, you need a certificate. Right now on LinkedIn, there's a ton of courses that you can take to just up level yourself. I think right now we're in an up leveling environment when the creator economy, like a lot of those creators, like a lot of people are landing brand partnership deals. Not all of them have degrees, but their personality is value, value, equity. So I think you just got to realize, like, what are you bringing to the table? Mm. But for me, my degree helped me get a seat at the table. So, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's awesome. Because okay, so, the being black and being a woman, listen, it is hard. <laughs> absolutely. You know what? And, and that was something I, that was one of the next things I wanted to dig into. You know, as, you know, you're navigating this corporate space um, and, you know, you obviously have the, uh, the, the prerequisite credentials, which are, you know, your college background and your education. Have you been in situations where you felt like you had to prove that you were supposed to be yes. um, at the table? Can yes. you talk to me about that? Yes. It It is honestly like a really crazy feeling. Listen to my bio, right? Like you reading my bio and listening to all of these achievements. But when you're entering corporate America or my experience when I entered corporate America, it was like culture shock for me. Mm. Like being black and have people question or challenge like your decision making, your work ethic, your ability to complete a task. It's like condescending. It mm-hmm. no, it's not like condescending. It is very condescending. I've experienced microaggressions. I've even made the, the to listen i've like left 
spaces and jobs because of that. And Mm -hmm. I, you know, I think that growing and knowing my worth has been very beneficial to me thus far. That has kind of given me the endurance to kind of persevere. Absolutely. And, and, and let's even dig into that a little bit more. Talk to me about talk to me about your, your self confidence because even just talking to you, you kind of exude, you know, this self confidence. You know, you're, I know you're in the corporate space, but here you are. You know, you're rocking your beautiful blonde natural hair, and yeah. I'm sure that that may not necessarily be uh, the norm in the hallways of Google. Talk to me about being able to show up to work every day as your authentic self and. How have you been able to do that? Are you still experiencing some 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 challenges in that? Yeah. And, and maybe if you could share some experiences around that. Yeah. So I will say, like, I have not, like, experienced, like, microaggressions and stuff at Google. It's just over the course of my entire career. So I definitely want to uh, correct that. But I don't know. I just can't not be myself. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm a black girl from the west side of Chicago. Like... I cannot lose a piece of myself when I walk into work every day. And I think this is why I've kind of had some challenges over the course of my career because I I choose to show up as myself. So when I walk through the hallways at Google, I'm speaking to the Black service workers. I'm speaking to the Black janitors. I'm speaking to the Black cooks and chefs. And I'm like, hey, what's up? How's your day going? Like, mm-hmm. I've made sure that black people in corporate spaces feel visible because I know what it's like to walk into an office and feel like, you know, I don't belong or I don't matter. That's something small, but big that I try to do to show up as myself. I, I don't know when someone asks me about my weekend, sometimes I'm very transparent about that. You know, I have a brother that is incarcerated, which fuels my passion towards helping people who are incarcerated or are formerly incarcerated. So Mm. I like to share my story so people don't get it twisted. Like, Mm. do not treat me as a token Black girl. And I think, you know, it's just work for me and it's something that I'll continue to do. One, one, One of the things that my dad, like, always, like, preaches to me is never forget who you are and don't forget where you come from. Mm-hmm. And that's something that I try to bring into every single space that I, you know, surround myself in. Absolutely. Shout out to dad. Great advice. Dad. Dad. Shout out to Fox. Yeah, absolutely. Let's talk about, cause Google is kind of famous for the idea of trying to balance the concept of work-life balance. I know they, Google yeah. is famous. I've read about the 20% time where people get a day to work on whatever they want to work on. And with you, you know, going to a, a big major university like DePaul, living in the city, working in a, you know, a huge tech company, you know, tech company like Google, it's kind of like the the little girls, little, you know, young boys dream, right? It's like, yeah. get your degree, live in a big city work at a big major company, almost like the TV shows are like all the TV shows are, you know, people living that kind of lifestyle. Mm-hmm. But talk to me about the work-life balance. Like what does it take to excel at your job? But how do you also excel at that job, but still have a life outside of that, outside of work? Yeah. Great question. I love talk about benefits. Google has amazing just benefits for us, the culture, in tech in general, I feel is fueled by work-life balance. When I look at kind of who makes up the majority of tech, you think older white men. These men have families. These men have things to do on the weekends. So when you think about work-life balance, like it does exist. Like what you're seeing now is a lot of people who are in consulting or finance. They're trying to pivot into tech because it's such a great work-life balance. Each day is different, right? Some days you might have a lighter workload and some days you might have a, you know, a more lengthy like workload. But I think in general, I have a great work-life balance. I do, you know, champion the benefits at Google. I think from my experience across different companies that I've worked for, they have the best benefits. They prioritize well-being. So like therapy, I'm off is encouraged when you're 
having mental challenges. And I, I say that it is encouraged because it is. I went on a four month leave when my grandmother passed and I was able to take time off to prioritize my well being, reconnect with family. And when I came back, like my team was like, you know, so happy that you were able to do that. Let us know if you want us to continue to like help out or some of these projects that we've been managing in your absence. And I really do appreciate that. So I think the culture, and I can only speak at Google, but the culture at Google is very supportive when it comes to prioritizing well-being. Mm, that is amazing. Let's, I would definitely, I know we've been talking a lot about Google, your career and everything that's going on today, but let's take it back. I want to learn about your early childhood influences. And so first question I have is, what do I need to understand about your earliest years? To understand the person that you are today, the, the you little know? girl Cheyenne. What do I need to understand about the six, seven, eight, nine, ten year old Cheyenne? I was Cheyenne? a great kid. I was a <laughs> no, no, no. My kid. So we need to like chime me and mom and dad. And- no, oh. my my parents to tell you I was a really great kid. I loved reading, so you always found a book in my hand. I was very obedient. I kind of just trusted in like my parents' leadership. So I didn't question a lot as a child. Like my mom just told me, just go to school, get A. So I did that. When I got <laughs> work, <laughs> my dad and mom told me, you know, go to school, work hard, try to be the best athlete you can. And I did that. I think I didn't start like self discovery or started to challenge the status quo until I got into high school. I want to say around junior year is when I started to question like, well, why should I do this? Like you're telling me this, but like, what's the purpose? What's the outcome? What's the value? (laughs) So my mom will often joke around and say like, you should have been a lawyer because the way that you dissect things and the way you question Mm-hmm. things like that is a skill that every lawyer like definitely have in order to be a great one let's see I was pretty quiet I was shy growing up with four bu- brothers I did have to be a little bit tough so when it came to our brothers you know I I, I didn't really back down from a fight but I think for the most most part I was like a great friend a great child and a great sister damn how has that impacted your career? The, you know, the obedience that turned into questioning authority, the, what is that? How has that impacted who you are now? Well, I could talk on just like, I'm trying to think where should I start? Should I start the obedience and challenging? Well, okay. I, I guess I'll start there. When you are growing as an adult, especially entering corporate America and you're seeing the people all leadership, you're seeing how they move and act towards you, you start to question whether or not they are a great leader. And I think that in my experiences, questioning a lot of things is allowing me to recognize and try to define what type of leader I want to be. Mm. I think questioning things in general has led to my development because it's allowed me to grow and really think about what I want long term and who I want to be as a person and how can I strive to be like that? I think me, me being around people and loving, loving my community and wanting to be the, be the best friend or partner or person in general has allowed me to forge really strong relationships. It's like networking isn't really as challenging for me. I like to connect with people you know, in real time and be really like authentic and genuine as a person. People yeah. vibe with that. The reason why I'm even talking to you is because of our mutual friend Drew. Drew Harris. Yes. Um, yes. That is my Shout brother. out to Drew. Shout out to Drew. Drew is my brother, like my big brother. I met him through supporting another friend. Mm. So uh, my one of my friends, Hassani Henderson, shout out, shout out Hassani. He was working at Pandora. And he threw a Black History Month event. And I like went in like just to support him. My my intention was just to support. I ended up meeting Drew, talking to him. And I was, you know, telling him how I, I come from a sports background. I'm really interested in sports entertainment. And he's like, wait, I work in sports entertainment. Send me your resume. There's a job for you. Mm. 
sent my resume, got hired. <laughs> wow. And like we've been locked in every since then. That is awesome. You know, and that caused me to actually ask a follow up question. Ever since. Then. You know, for anybody who may be anybody who may be watching this, talk to me about the value of getting out of your shell. Yeah. Building relationships. Being open to those, you know, uh, serendipitous moments where you can meet somebody who you, who could connect you to somebody. How important is that for a person who's looking to uh, 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 succeed in the, in the manner that you have? Yeah, I think it's very important. So every job I've had has been through me knowing somebody and them extending me a referral. So I think mm -hmm. it's very important to build relationships with people. And that was all through me networking across, like really try to build a tribe and community of people that matches, you know, your character and who have similar, you know, goals and dreams as you use those people, because I think those are the most important relationships that you will develop. All of my friendships, my close friends have turned out to be super impactful and, and like valuable, valuable from you know, the financial view and securing a bag. Like all of my friends have secured the bag and we're helping each other secure the bag. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, like six years from now, if I was to go to a networking event, my goal was to talk to the CEO, CMO, CFO, anybody in C-suite or who I thought was important. Now, when I go to networking events and I haven't been in a while, but <laughs> if I were to go to a networking event, my new intention is to meet a peer who's in the same position as me, trying to better themselves. Because I think that person, whatever they're going to do, like we can help each other. And like that's how we're going to make it. Mm, that's a great, that's a great point. That's a great point. So talk to me about in regards to your childhood and growing up, because I know we've touched on it a few times, uh, the concept of sports. Yeah. It feels like sports definitely has the connection when it comes to networking and the social aspect of being open to meet with people and being comfortable being involved with the team. Talk to me about what got you started in track and field. Yeah. Um, how did you excel to the point where now you're getting uh, scholarships to go to DePaul, which is not cheap. No. So, uh, like close <laughs> to 54000 a year now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So talk to me about the role that sports played in your life yeah. um, as a kid and how it helped develop develop you. Yeah, shout out to my mom. So my mom is someone who believes that a child should not just go to school and come home. I'm with you. So yep. mm -hmm. shout, out, shout out to her. Shout out to yes. her. She's the GOAT. So when I was going to high school, even before I got... You, started high school my mom's like okay we're n like we know that you know your class is going to be you know handled but what activities are you going to be a part of and mm -hmm. i was like i don't know mm -hmm. and she's like okay well you used to be in choir like is choir something of interest i'm like maybe band because i used to play the piano mm -hmm. Do you want to like join band and do the piano? I'm like, I don't know. And she was like, okay, well, here's the deal. I'm going to give you a week to go Whoa. on Young's website. And I want you to come back to me at the end of the week and tell me what you want to do. Because you're not going to just go to school and come home. I love your mama. I love yeah. your mama. <laughs> yeah. So I did that. I took the week. I was browsing. Nothing really stood out. And then I saw a track and field. That was like a light bulb in my brain because growing up, like we used to have races on the block and whoever like won a race, the winner would get like a dollar or something like that. Very like childish, but that's what like kids in my neighborhood did. And I used to win almost all the time. I used to even beat boys. So I'm like, okay, well, okay, all right, let me just, let me just try track, mm -hmm. go to practice. I absolutely loved it. And it was so funny because I went the first day and I just kept showing up. It was one of those things where I just wanted to show up every single day. It took me two weeks to realize that I was not at track practice. I was actually at cross country practice. Oh, really? Yes. <laughs> so in the fall, <laughs> track practice, track is later in the year. So track is right. like 
winter, spring. Yeah, winter. yeah, yeah. This was the fall, obviously. School starts in the fall. So it wasn't track yet. I was running cross country for two weeks. Mm. Did not know, but I enjoyed the people. The girls were super nice. They seemed like they were actually friends. And that's what I wanted, to have actual friends. Great friends. The coach was really nice. And then a month later, I was on varsity. And <laughs> yes, yes. And then at that point, I couldn't quit because my coach was telling my parents she could get a scholarship to college. And when wow. I heard that, they was like, oh, no, you're not quitting. You have All right, let's back up here. You just kind of brushed past that real quickly. So wait a minute. Yeah. The coach knew from your freshman year, yeah. two or three weeks in, yeah. that you had potential scholar college scholarship talent. Yes, because it goes back to like me trusting in leadership, right? If my like when my coach told me to do something, I just did it, you know. Mm. <laughs> so being teachable, I think that I mean, obviously, I was fast. But you can't really gauge whether or not someone's going to, you know, be great. So that's a great question to ask him. Like, how did you know? But it was probably just like my personality and my ability to listen and take direction. I think it's something most coaches look for when they're recruiting people. So, yeah. Absolutely. So, and to kind of piggyback on that, talking about your coach, I know we've talked about moms. I know we've talked about dad yeah. and how pivotal of an influence they've been in your life. Outside of your mom and dad, who else, as you were growing up in childhood, are there any teachers, coaches, you know, who else do you feel like was influential in, in your development as a young, as a youngster? Yeah, I feel like I've always had black teachers. So the majority of all my teachers have definitely, you know, encouraged me, built me up. I went to an all black grammar, grammar school on the west side of Chicago, Elaine Lack Charter Academy which I used to be on the board for, but that was all black grammar school ran by black women as principal and vice principal. And I think that they really champion being like, being the best, you know, from there, you know, at Whitney Young, having just teachers in general know that there's a standard, you know, cause that Whitney Young, like there's a certain standard that, mm. you know, teachers expect students expect from ourselves so I just think like I've been just I've just been very fortunate to be in spaces where the standard the bar is always that high mm. absolutely hey just listening to you talk you said something that reminded me of someone else I interviewed uh Miss Alita Wingfield she's a, a managing director at Morgan Stanley oh. uh the only black woman who is a managing director um at Morgan Stanley and oh. she went to yeah, she went to Spelman undergrad, and she talked about how she loved being at Spelman because when she was at Spelman, her her race and her her sex uh, was secondary. What was primary was what kind of student she was, what kind of person she was, and so she didn't have to carry that weight around every day on being a black woman because it was they all were black women. Talk to me about the role that it played for you going to, you know, elementary, you know, elementary school system, right, and operated by Black women, mostly Black women. Obviously, you know, Whitney Young has a very strong African-American presence. Mm -hmm. How does that impact your your education, in, in your personal opinion? Or did it impact your education? Yeah, I think, I think my mom really had more, more of a, you know, an impact. I think your parents are obviously like your first teachers, but I think when I got to Winnie Young, I realized like this is serious. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I say that because coming from an all black grammar school to Winnie Young, Winnie Young is very diverse, but I was in classes with Asian kids, Hispanic kids, you know, white kids. And I think it forced me out of my bubble, right? Mm -hmm. Like, yet. Yeah, I was like smart and I was, you know, a great student in eighth grade, but this is the big leagues. So yeah, I think, yeah. <laughs> so I think it taught me how to compete in a different way. I didn't want to be the one who had the lowest test score in the class. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think it like challenged me or it reminded me to always remain competitive. 
outside of track, right? Because honestly, like I was a student athlete and I wanted to be the best at track, but I wanted to be at least not the worst <laughs> from an academic yeah. point. And I think I carried it over to DePaul, right? The largest Catholic private institution in the country. Mm. And I ended up being one of the only black people, one of the black women in my classes. So from there, yeah. it didn't really bother me because I was already used to it. Like I was already used to competing. I was already used to not being, not seeing a lot of black people in the class at this point. I think it was easier for me to kind of navigate college a little bit better than probably most people who probably came from an all black grammar school in an all black high school. So I just think it was just easier for me to kind of navigate the space. Absolutely. Absolutely. So the diversity of Whitney Young really prepared you for DePaul and absolutely. And now Google and whatever else. Comes. Yep. Yeah. If I, I saw to show you a picture of my lunchroom table is two Asian girls a Polish girl, and maybe me and two other black girls. Mm. So. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. So let's talk about let's talk about your time at DePaul because you you know I was a student athlete. I played football at the University of Iowa. Um, Y'all in the so, hot seat right now. I was in the hot seat right now. Yeah, don't derail this interview by bringing up. Okay, I'm yeah. sorry. I'm sorry. Right, you are right. You are right. We got some work to do, but I'm excited about some of the changes that's happening. And we on our way, Cheyenne. We on our way. But, you know, I remember the, you know, the balancing act of playing football, which was super demanding time-wise. There was really no off time. Chris, you know, Christmas vacation, summertime. It, it was always, it never stopped. Yeah. And I'm sure track has that same similar component. Talk mm -hmm. to me about the demands of being a Division One college athlete and you weren't just out there running because you're breaking records out there on the track and field on the track so talk to me about doing that and those high demands while also juggling academics while also probably trying to maintain some you know resemblance of, of a social life how did you balance and juggle those things and what advice would you have to young people who may be in that same situation right now who also mm -hmm. or who you know maybe look to maybe do that one day Yes. Great question. I didn't balance it. <laughs> Freshman year, I learned that I had a femoral stress fracture. So the femur is the longest bone in your body, and I fractured that. And so I had to take some time off of track, and that impacted my mental health tremendously. I think that most people who play sports like sports is a big part of who you are your identity so if you take that away like who are you how do you show up in the world like how do you navigate life when you removed a large part of your life from your life mm -hmm. healed a little bit software year comes around i refracture my leg which is an alarm wow. of my body and Early junior year, I had to make the decision to quit the team. And that was probably one of the hardest decisions that I made. Like At that point in my life, that was definitely the hardest decision I could have possibly made by myself. Like that was the first adult decision I made for myself. Wow. Um, and from there, I was kind of searching for, okay, well, what's next? I'm no longer an athlete. I'm not showing up to practice. I'm not seeing my best friends as much anymore. Because they're mm -hmm. practice, what do I do? And so that led me to seek community in other places. So I joined like a black girl community board called Strong. I learned more about Greek life. I learned a lot about Delta Sigma Theta. So then I think not having sports in my life allowed me to discover who Cheyenne was without mm -hmm. it attached to me. So I became a Delta I leaned more into my classes. I got my first global work study. And then I just, I just kept going from there, but it was very really challenging to balance them all and remain sane, <laughs> healthy and yes. sane. I don't think that it's impossible to balance all of those things. I just think in my, from my personal experience, I was not able to do that. And I had to make a decision and choice on what I wanted to prioritize. Absolutely. And wow, you know, what's so amazing is 
the the emotional intelligence you had to have at such a young age because yeah. you know you just kind of gave us a lemons to lemonade story where you flipped it all around you know something that could have been devastating for many people you know the injury that removed the the sport career the athletics career away from you it seems like it almost opened up doors for you did you had did you have was it your mom talking to you at this time was it your dad no, I didn't talk to anyone about this. I made the decision and I was going to stand by it and no one could convince me, not even the coach, no one, not, not my best friends, not my teammates. It was me. I had had enough, you know, again, sports was a big part of my life. And when you're an athlete, an elite athlete, like you kind of try to hold on to, to it and be like, nope, I can fix it. I can, yep. end, I can get better. If I just take physical therapy more seriously, if I eat healthier, like all those things can definitely like get you back. But for me, I didn't want any of it. And so, and even just not even just making a decision to pivot, but how did you, it seems like you made that decision to pivot, but you also was able to tell yourself the story that it was a good thing. Yeah. That it wasn't like, woe is me. I guess, how did you do that? Because, you know, for a 20 year old, 19, 21 year old to, to be in a headspace to, to make that decision, but also look at it as a positive, it shows a high level of maturity. Yeah. Well, I knew it wasn't going to be the end of the world. Um, I knew I was going to get my degree and graduate. So I knew I could get a job and it was just one of those things or one of those situations where I just knew that this chapter of my life has ended and I you know I had a great chapter I think because I achieved so much early in my career prior to college I wasn't chasing anything mm. like I became a junior Olympian at what 17 mm. I have over 100 medals probably close to 200 some medals okay talk talk to me Diane. I don't even know how many medals I have at this point yeah. trophies I have at this point in my life but I feel like because I was so successful in my career leading up to the point of injury, I was okay with taking a step back because in my mind, I did what I needed to do. My priority was to get a scholarship to college. I did that. Right. Yeah. I did that. I Absolutely. did what my parents wanted. I did what I wanted. Yeah. Uh, so if I quit or not, I was going to be okay. Oh, it seems like it kind of a theme. It seems like you've had a certain level of confidence in yourself yeah. going yeah. back even from when you were a kid. Yeah. And you feel like, let me ask you this question. Do you feel like that's um, a personality trait, like DNA, like you were born with that? Do you feel like that's in relation to the incredible parents you had, the great yeah. schools? What would you attribute that, that confidence to? I think it's a mix of DNA and my parents, both my parents, used to tell me all the time, you could do anything you put your mind to. Mm. You know, do all things that Christ who strengthens me. You know? Come on now. Yep. And a God fearing mother. Come on now. Um and then it's just like what I come from, like my mom, big family, Mrs. rural Mississippi, you know, share proper, come to Chicago, and she's been her own boss for twenty eight years. So mm. A part of me feels like it has to be a genetic personality trait too, because there's some things that you know could be genetically linked. Certain personality traits can be genetically linked, so I think it could be a mixture of my 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 parents affirming me. My parents tell me every single day, all the time. To this day, they tell me like I'm the smartest person. I'm this. I'm that. My mom greets me every day and says, "Hello, my beautiful daughter." Like that. Mm. Mar- or we're like when she texts me, "Hi, beautiful daughter." I'm just like, "Mom, you just say hi, shy." So I just think that my parents and the spaces I've been in, my teachers have always fostered a level of confidence in me that I just continuously apply throughout my life. For like, for sure. That is amazing. That is amazing. Shout out to mom again. You know, I mom needs to be back up. My oh, that is that. That's awesome. My next question is, what is the best piece of advice that you've received during your career thus far? Mm. Uh, 
whether it goes back to when you were younger or, you know, now that you've been in the working world, what is a good piece of advice, whether it's a, a manager, yeah. a co-worker, a elder in the church, whomever, have you got, have you gotten any piece of advice that, that you feel like has been impactful in your life and that maybe you would share if you were, you know, if you were, you know, talking to some young person? Yeah. I had, I think two come to mind leverage your resources you didn't make it this far just to not get far leverage the resources of your community your university like you're an alum see what type of benefits they have for you if you're a job seeking like go back <laughs> to their career center and see how you can network with people to land a job and just do stuff join the board join Join a, your company's Black Resource Group. Get a technical certificate in something. Go to another company's Black History Month programming. You know, apply for things that you're not sure that you qualify for. I think a lot of my success have been from me just doing, just trying new things, just being interested in new things. And I think like the more that you put yourself out there and lean on your community and resources that you paid for, Okay. Mm. Come on, man. <laughs> it's only a matter of time before something pops, right? They say that the best people, the best people who start the business are people who don't have a fear of failure and take risks constantly. So I would definitely say constantly bet on yourself, take a risk, and just do things that you enjoy and that you're passionate about. Because if you're passionate about them, then you're going to be great at it. That is amazing, amazing career advice. I got a follow-up question. This is more of a, a question in regards to life advice. If you had to go back and talk to the the 18-year-old Cheyenne, fresh off of the Junior Olympics and ready to go to DePaul, and you had to give her some life advice, you know, advice that would, you know, apply no matter what career she went in, mm -hmm. you know, type of advice that may apply to relationships or parenting or social aspects what kind of life advice would you give the 18 year old Cheyenne yeah never forget who you are and where you came from and you don't have to change and conform if you do not want to mm -hmm. that you are the bag there's more options out there for you and just move around if things aren't serving you move around I've done that in my career like I this is so I pivoted three times in my career I started in media then I went into sports and now I'm in tech if things aren't serving you leave I think right now you're winning thing you know the the young millennial old Gen Zer I think right now there's a lot of self-discovery going on and being black in corporate America and knowing that 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 journey to C-suite, baby, <laughs> <laughs> that journey is a, that's a long journey. Right. So, and if you want to go after that, that's great, but you don't have to change who you are to get there. There are different ways to do that. And you don't have to stay at one company to do so. And it doesn't matter the name of the company you are the bag. So wherever you go, it's going to be a great company because you're there. Mm. That's like the best piece of advice I can, I, I can give to someone. Absolutely. Absolutely. And as we wrap up, you know, the foundation the the driving force behind this, this podcast is, is mentorship. You know, it's the idea of being able to indirectly mentor somebody through watching this video and hearing your story and hearing the, the, the all of those key pieces of, of wisdom that you that you share with us over the last, you know, 45, 50 minutes or so. And so the question I have for you is it's a two part question. First part of the question is, are you actively mentoring anybody? Mm -hmm. uh, and part two to that question is, if, if someone who watched this podcast and who, you know, was really compelled by your story, maybe they want to get into marketing, maybe they're a girl from the west side of Chicago, maybe, you know, whatever the connection may be. If they reached out, uh, would you be open to them? Would you be open to connecting with them and also, you know, sh sharing some of your wisdom in, in whatever capacity that you have available? So two questions. Yeah, mentor, 
Yeah. And if so, can we connect you to some people to mentor? Yeah. No, I don't formally mentor. It's so weird because I'm like, I'm not that great to mentor, but I'm just kidding. I do not mentor. I actually don't have a mentor either. I think I have sponsors and I'm right now finding mentorship difficult because I'm being very conscious about what type of mentor I want to have. I think right now, a lot of older black corporate professionals, you know, they've done the hard work, they've played the game, and they think that our generation should do the same and follow in that path. I do not agree. I don't think that you have to play the game in order to succeed. Mm. And I that people in power and have the influence to change the game should change it and learn how to play it to their benefit. So right now I'm searching for my own mentor who will affirm me and encourage me to continue the path that I want and not like not play the game that right. probably won't even benefit me anyways. Let's be real. So yeah, I'm 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 definitely open to mentoring someone. I will say right now, I will never tell you to play the game. What I'll do is I'll, you know, collaborate with you and we'll strategize how to get you where you want to go without you having to. I think that's what I am seeking and that's what I want to give out. Absolutely. Absolutely. And to kind of piggyback, I agree with you 100%. I, I have a same, same philosophy when it comes to mentoring, I have a few mentors, you know, I have a, 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 you know, one of my mentors is a, is a health mentor, you know, it's a 75 year old man who I go, I go on walks, I go on walks with him and my other, my other, I call him my Medicare homie. He, other one, he's 79, but they're both in better shape than me. Yeah. And, you know, I learned a lot from them. They, they happily married. They got strong marriages. They got, you know, great family lives. And so, you know, they're my mentors. I got a business mentor as well. You know, I got mentors in, in different different areas of my life. Yeah. But what I, what I found is that the mentor-mentee relationship is driven by the mentee. Mm-hmm. You know, the mentor's job is just to be. Yeah. And the mentee's job is to pursue and to ask questions and to direct, well, what about this? Well, how can I do this? Mm-hmm. And so, you know, it's something that we're we're very, very passionate about. And especially for people who, you know, who haven't been as blessed as you to have such incredible parents, you know, you already got a built in mentorship situation. Yeah. My mom, my mom is like my mentor at this point. Yeah. Yeah. You already have that great situation set up. And so, so somebody reached out and said, and this Cheyenne girl is amazing. You know, I am, you know, whatever stage in my life or career. And, you know, I think I can learn from her. I would like to get connected with her would it be okay if i passed your email along to this person absolutely absolutely i'm here to be of help i love service i love community service i was just you know i'm bringing for everyone black (laughs) um (laughs) oh i definitely want to thank Issa. okay Okay. yeah 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 i adore Issa. i love Issa too i adore her i think the way that she's been able to navigate her life and career it's exactly how I want to navigate mine. And um, so here's here's one key point, though, Cheyenne. And I it actually interviewed somebody who said something. I thought I was one of the few people who thought this way. Like, I make people my mentor who's never met me before. Yeah. Like, if I could, if you got a bunch of videos online or you wrote a book or if I can learn about what you do and how you think, oh. I'm putting the mentor tag on. Yeah. We, may not, we may not even. Yeah, yeah, so, because it, yeah, because it's like blueprints in real time, right? Like, absolutely. She became the first person that I know of to do what she's done so far. So it's like, okay, yeah, it's starting to like break the ceiling, right? Like the glass is broke because someone did it, so it's yep. possible for me to do it as well. But 100, 100, percent that's one of my 2024 goals. <laughs> To actually secure a mentor, um, but well, yeah. Well, I can say this too. This is something that we can even chat with off camera. But definitely reach out to me if you have an idea on what kind of person. Because I've I've interviewed probably thirty 
30, about 30 people so far for this, this podcast. Okay. And when I tell you, amazing, like you name what kind of industry, what kind of whatever, and I probably could make a, make a connection for you. And all of these people, anybody who comes with this podcast are typically people who are passionate about giving back. Yeah. Who are passionate about being a connector because somebody was a connector for them. So for sure. Um, um, yeah, I, I, I got a couple of people in mind who I think would be great for you to uh, right. connect with. Uh, uh, super Networking successful. Across people, network across. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Diane, it was a pleasure, a pleasure Thank speaking you. with you today. I look forward to definitely being able to stay in contact with you. Thank you for sharing your time today and, and sharing your wisdom. Do you have any parting words you want to share before we wrap up? Yes. Again, thank you so much for inviting me. This is my first time doing something like this. So you never would have been able to tell. Listen, you you have definitely taken me out of my comfort zone just today. So I'm sure the growth that all that, you know, I just experienced just throughout this session definitely will benefit from that. Again, thank you so much for even just creating a platform, being a visionary to just see that there's a need for something like this in our community. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Cheyenne. And we, we look forward to, 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 to learning more and, and getting to know you a little bit better. Yes.